And for this, let me request, please, if you will, any three gentlemen, please come. Once we have three, that's fine. It's not an impartation. <laughs> please, you come up here. I want you to stand here. You stand here, that's right. Please come, sir. Just stand with me. Please come, my friend. Okay, you stand at the extreme, sir. Thank you. And then you stand here. Now, everybody watch this. I'm trying to illustrate for you. I like to treat graphically people thinking pictures. I want to show you the entire journey of the believer from infancy to the place of power. From weakness to the place of strength. There are three faces in every believer's journey. I'm saying this to you because at every point in your Christian experience, you should be able to define where you are in that journey. So as I'm announcing it to you, I'm helping you, I'm giving you a picture so that you will know whether you are behind schedule or you will know if you are making progress. Are we together? Now, the foundation for everyone who seeks to be used by God to be a manifestation of God's glory is called salvation. Please say it and write it. Say salvation. salvation. One more time. Salvation. As simple and as basic as this sounds, there are many people roaming around the gates of the kingdom who have not even entered. Proximity to the things of God does not guarantee admission. I hope I'm right if I say there are people who live within the Harvard community but are not students. And they've been there older and longer than the students. They can lead you to any school or faculty you seek but they are not students. There are people who walk around the airport and they've never flown an aircraft out of their nations. So just because you are around where God is moving, just because you are around church, just because you are around spiritual things does not automatically make you a believer. According to scripture, and we must restore this because there are many people in church who are not saved. That is the real problem. There is a formula for salvation. You don't get salvation. There is an exact spiritual protocol that leads to salvation. And if that experience has not happened, you may be a nice person having a wonderful heart, but you are not saved. I'm not a student of Harvard. I enjoyed a wonderful time roaming around your school, but I'm not. Because a tour around Harvard is not the same as admission. Now, I have pictures of myself in Harvard. You can't change that. Am I right on that? There are many believers who have their pictures near the Holy Spirit, near the Bible, near a pastor, near a revival meeting, near church, but they are not believers. Here's what the Bible says. John chapter 3 and verse 16. Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus. John chapter 3 begins, it was a discourse between Jesus and one man, a Pharisee. He had been convicted by the ministry of Jesus even though he was forced to pretend because he was with his colleagues. Now he smuggles himself to Jesus by night and here's what he says. Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher sent from God, he says, for no man can do these miracles which thou doest except God be with him. John chapter 3 now. Verse 3, Jesus now begins to speak and says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Hmm? Then Jesus now says, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. The discussion continues until we arrive at verse 16. Jesus is still speaking. For God so loved the world. He proved that he so loved the world by giving his then only begotten son. He's no longer his only begotten son. He is now the first begotten of we, the brethren. Are we together? Anyway, it says that whosoever, I like this. Jesus leaves the, the line blank, whosoever. 
There are certain things in the Bible that the, the Bible will say he gave on to some. But when it has to do with the business of salvation, it is for whosoever. A drunkard, a prostitute, a bad person, a good person, a self-righteous person, everybody. Whosoever believeth on him, watch this. There is already a verdict from heaven that if you believe in him, as touching his being Savior, Lord, and Christ, that you should not perish, but have life everlasting. I don't want to get into a theological explanation of that word everlasting life. That was not an accurate translation. It is not everlasting life. It is the Greek word zoe. It is a quality of living beyond everlasting. No. No. It is talking about a kind of life, not just survival indefinitely. Are we together? John would later grow in the spirit and in his epistle, he would call it the life of God. Not just everlasting life. Anyway, back to our discussion. So this brother finds himself roaming around the streets of Boston, Cambridge, anywhere around your region. And one day he comes into this beautiful auditorium and he's seated at the back. Then a preacher is preaching, singing, shouting like And the Spirit of God, because Jesus says, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, the Holy Spirit has a threefold ministry to creation, to unbelievers, and to believers. So the Holy Spirit's assignment is to convict this fellow. Watch this now. So I'm preaching. He's listening to me. I'm talking about the life of God. A beautiful presentation. I'm giving a manifesto of what God wants to make out of his life. Are we together? And whilst I'm speaking through the frailty of my speech, the Spirit of God is riding through his heart. And I make what we know to be an altar call. A proposition. Are we together? The first sermon that was preached in the book of Acts was by Peter. And Peter made a profound statement. He said, let it be known to you, O Israel, that the same Jesus who you have crucified has today been exalted as Lord and Christ. It is not every information about Jesus that translates to salvation. Believing Jesus came from God is not what saves you. No. No. There is an exact information. Believing Jesus was a good man does not give you salvation. <laughs> Believing Jesus lived a sinless life is true, but does not give you salvation. There is an exact information. You must believe his substitutionary sacrifice. You must believe that he died and was buried and that he resurrected by the glory of the Father. You must believe that he paid the penalty of your sin. Are we together? And the Bible says in believing that report, you receive the honor of his life. There is no other name under heaven, the Bible declares, given unto men. I'm saying this because most people in church are around the things of God, they, but they have not made this declaration. So we're trying to use counseling and therapy as wonderful as that is. I don't reject that. But let me tell you, nothing will be a replacement for a genuine encounter with Jesus. So there are many problems that plague people in our world and our churches today. It is because they are alienated from the life of God. There is no amount. The demons that afflict them will step out while you are counseling them and wait for them to cry out their lives and get back because they have a legitimate access. And you believe what you are hearing. The Bible calls an encounter with Jesus a translation from the kingdom of darkness. Do you believe the Bible? To the kingdom of God's dear son. God's dear son. Now, as ordinary as that confession is, there is a miracle happening in the spirit. So you declare that Jesus is Lord. The protocol, the formula for administering salvation is found in Romans chapter 10 from verse 9 and 10. Please do not forget this for the rest of your life. 
that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, someone say with thy mouth. With thy mouth. No assumption. Your mouth has a role to play. It is a declaration of your inadequacy. Are we together? Salvation is never administered to the arrogant and the self-righteous. This is why your mouth has to verbalize your need for God. No assumptions. God made us free moral agents. He will not usurp on your will. Even at the detriment of your eternal destiny, you can choose to ignore him and he will respect your choice. So this man confesses the lordship of Jesus and does that believing in his heart that God raised him from the dead. The Bible says you shall be saved. No matter the past, whether you feel anything or don't feel any, it is not a feeling. It's a spiritual reality. And let me tell you this. If any one of you under the sound of my voice has gone through that state where you came to a point of an awareness of your inadequacy outside of Christ and you verbalize it by declaring his lordship, I want you to know whether you feel it or not, based on the authority of Scripture, you are saved. You are saved. You may not cry and shout and roll on the floor, but the truth of Scripture still remains the truth. And no matter how you, you can fall under the anointing and you are still not saved. Falling under the anointing does not mean you are saved. It is the effect of the power of God within your circumference. That is not salvation. Are we together? Yes. Receiving it. I can pray for an, everybody Jesus prayed for to be healed was an unbeliever. Nobody could believe until he resurrected from the dead. But everybody Jesus healed still died. Everybody Jesus fed still died. They didn't have the life of life. Are we together? Now, so this gentleman gets saved. That's the first phase. Salvation. Do not forget this. The greatest need of an unbeliever is salvation. Anytime you see an unbeliever, you can feed them, you can counsel them, you can love them, but just know that the greatest need from a spiritual standpoint, my dear people, anytime you see an unbeliever anywhere, that may be your spouse with all due respect, maybe your children, maybe well-meaning people, colleagues in your office, students, the moment you see an unbeliever, I want you to know that no matter what you do, give, say, the greatest need of every unbeliever from an eternal standpoint and from a spiritual standpoint is salvation. If I feed you, my dear brother, if I clothe you, that is wonderful, expected of a Christian, but you will still go to hell. Many of you are seated right now listening to me and there are wonderful people you've been kind to but they are on their way to hell. Yes, sir. I hate being a bearer of bad news and I wish it were a lie, but it is true. Spouses going to hell. Children going to hell. Sincere people who greet you smiling at you and you feel so warm when they smile, but they are still going to hell. Grandparents going to hell. Maybe beautiful, intelligent Harvard students going to hell. Many people roaming around the streets of Cambridge, Massachusetts, Boston, going to hell. There were people who woke up on earth this morning, but they are in hell right now. The greatest need of an unbeliever is not welfare. The greatest need of an unbeliever, ladies and gentlemen, an unbeliever meaning one who has not declared the lordship of Christ. Again, I say, it's not about being good or bad. If you do not have Jesus in your heart, you are called an unbeliever. Not necessarily a sinner, but an unbeliever. 
So, this gentleman, upon declaring the Lordship of Christ, he has passed the first gate. Profitably so. But to summarize quickly so that we'll wrap up for tonight. If this gentleman remains this way, he is saved, but he is going to become a frustrated, ineffective believer. Did you get what I said? Is he saved? Yes. Genuinely so? Yes. Has he met Jesus? Yes. But you see, the profit of the life that he has received cannot be enjoyed at this level. This is the challenge with many Christians. They are saved. But the Bible says an heir for as long as he's a child. Same attack an unbeliever is having, he's still having it. Same problems, same weaknesses, same addictions. Come on now. Same whatever. To the point that the gentleman looks at his former self through the window and cannot see the difference. Because he was just a step away. Even though a translation. Now, most believers have not been mentored into understanding that surrendering your life, receiving the life of Jesus is the beginning of the journey, not the end of it. So they get saved and they're angry, wondering, what is wrong with my life? Demons do not seem to respect my confession of Jesus. Absolutely. That leads to the next phase. The next phase is called transformation. This is the next phase. It is at the point of transformation that the riches of eternal life begin to manifest experientially. Look, this is the destiny of this man. Watch this. Remember my teaching? That your prophetic destiny, your preordination, have you forgotten? Is that you eventually become the glory of God. This is the future self of that man right there. That weak man. That prayerless man. That man who does not love the things of God. Literally struggled his way. Yet, that is still his destiny. He will go to bed and see that prophet. He would go to bed and see that evangelist. He would go to bed and see that world changer. You see, there is still a long distance between the future him and the current him. Now watch this. When God wants to help this man, there are three things he introduces to his life. Please do not forget. It is the arrival of these three forces that translates this one from a saved believer to a transformed believer. Number one, the word of God. Number two, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Number three, the ministry of a teaching priest. Please take note. These tripartite ministries or forces are responsible for transiting this believer from an ordinary weak believer, full of God's life, but never having an experience of the same. Again, the word of God. Are we together? God grants you access to the word of God. But the word of God without the ministry of the teaching priest will not profit you because it must be line upon line, precept upon precept. Your transformation must be methodical. Let me tell you this. Honestly, if God puts before you a, 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 um, a true shepherd, huh? someone to mentor you and to guide you, I want you to know that he showed you love and kindness. If you fall into a wrong church, a wrong hand, that complicates this process. There are many believers who as soon as they got saved, it was a wrong hand that received them. And so for the next 10 years, it was a journey of total waste, confusion, got into practices. And after 10 years, looking at themselves now, they are still saying, Say for 20 years. But the wrong hand. Maybe I'm describing someone right now. If only you had a teaching priest indeed 
one year under constructive methodical mentorship, you would have become a wonder by now. Anyway, so he grants you the word, say the word. The word. Then the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And then number three, the ministry of a teaching priest. Listen, I'm giving you this spiritual education so that you can leave this place and know exactly what the challenge is with any believer. When someone tells you, you know, I, I'm saved, I'm not growing. Aha, you can fill in the blanks. You can tell the person with, the, the, is with surgical precision, I know what is wrong with you. You do not have access to the word. You are not truly enjoying the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And ultimately, I see that you lack the ministry of a teaching priest. This is why we invite people to church. We do not just invite people to church because we are looking for crowds and membership. It's our partnership with the Holy Spirit to bring these kinds of people and those before them so that they can get to this phase. That means if you do not participate in in-gathering and soul winning, you are doing heaven a disservice. I was glad when they said unto me, let us, not let me, let us, let us, let us, let us, as for me and my house, how will they serve the Lord until they are, they are taught the ways of the Lord? So now, this man is fortunate to meet a teaching priest and using scripture in partnership with the ministry of the Holy Spirit, I begin to mentor this weak man. I show him that prayer can transit men. I submit him to the ministry of prayer, guiding him through a system that is already predefined. This man starts to pray. The weak man begins to be strong. The man who knew no scripture, you see that now? That prayer ministry, he is under constructive mentorship. So I am guiding him. He learns the value of service as he sits under this anointing week in, week out. After one year, you look for that former gentleman, you don't find him again. He's not here, but he's not there. He's shifted. Give this man three years and he's moved. You look at him and say, I was in your church when you were saved. And he says, you're right, but that was the former me. This one has grown, Ephesians 4, 18, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their minds. So the teaching priest has worked in partnership with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, introducing him to the various facets of the kingdom life, building his understanding. Now he knows the value of prayer. He prays at home and in church. He knows the value of service. He's not just a member, he has become a worker. You see that now? He knows the value of fasting. He understands the value of consecration. Are you seeing that now? Yes, he understands the value of transformation. When this man is given a gift of $100, he doesn't run around just to buy clothes. He would go to a bookstore and get quality Christian materials because he's been mentored to see the value of a transformed mind. Now, eventually, he arrives here. We're wrapping up. Great journey so far. So, when he gets here, he begins to see the manifestation of the life of God. He begins to see certain things happen in his life. But even this is not all. There is one more face. This face is called empowerment. So, salvation, transformation, empowerment. Let me tell you what most believers do. From here, they want to jump through an impartation. Sorry to have to drag you, my friend. Are we together? So once they see a man of God, they quickly get on their knees and say, you know what, it doesn't matter how transformed, I just God saved. You just do whatever you have to do on my head. And they believe that they've been... No, it doesn't work that way. There are no jumping classes in the Spirit. Salvation... The greatest need 
of a transformed believer is the grace to validate the things you now know. These talks of encounter that gives you salvation, these talks of the inner workings of the Spirit, at this point you are knowledgeable, but you need grace to defend the things you know. This man is in ignorance. This one has knowledge, but the knowledge may not have proof. So you need empowerment. This is the model Jesus had with the disciples. At this point, he said, tarry ye in Jerusalem. I spent three years teaching you, but that does not qualify you to go and represent me. But look at the ratio of impartation to transformation. And I submit to you, this is one challenge with the Pentecostal charismatic circle. We do not place premium on transformation. Jesus spent three and a half years of constructive mentorship to one night of encounter with the Spirit. Don't rush to lay hands on people. Don't rush to just minister to people. Bring them to a point. The value of empowerment is when the grace comes on a transformed mind. The oil always assumes the shape of the vessel. The challenge with the wife of the prophet was not the potential of the oil, but the vessel that was hosting the oil made it small. And the prophet said, go and borrow vessels. You can't borrow oil, but you can borrow vessels. And he says, in borrowing, borrow not a few. Expand your capacity and the oil will look like the change to you. Two people can be anointed, same grace, but limited in their operation because for one, the grace comes upon a mindset that is not transformed and you would not see the potential of that anointing. That same anointing will come upon another person, are we together? And on the strength of his or her transformation, you would see that the person will move in power. There are many of our fathers who did not have secular enlightenment nor proper mentorship, but by their press through prayer and fasting, they access certain graces. And you would see that they were so anointed, but the potential of that anointing was boxed through a low-level transformation. If that same anointing comes upon another person who spent time building capacity, that's when you see the kind of anointing they imparted on you. When God delays in anointing you, it's not demonic. He's giving you room to expand so that when that grace comes, the full potential of what that anointing carries, are we together now, will be made visible. So, the greatest need of a transformed believer is empowerment. This man, the difference between this man and this man is not necessarily knowledge is that this one has received the engracing. It is at the point of empowerment you change from being a believer to a witness. We'll take it from there tomorrow. This is where I'll find a place to stop here. God's goal is not for you to remain a believer. You start by being a believer, and in addition to being a believer, you graduate to a witness. Your real relevance in the kingdom it's not when you are a believer. Your real relevance to God and to your world is when you become a witness. In the book of Revelations, Jesus was not just a believer. He was called a faithful witness. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, he says, You shall receive the Holy Ghost, power after the Holy Ghost is come, and you shall be not preachers, not students, not witnesses. Tomorrow we'll teach on this. The ones that God is looking for are not just born-again Christians. The ones that God is looking for are not just believers. God is looking for witnesses. A witness is a matured believer who has transited to a point where he can assume kingdom responsibility, representing the purposes of God and defending the interests of the kingdom. It is at that point the glory of God is revealed in you. Are we together? So at any given point in church, you will always find these three groups of people. In fact, four. There are those who are outside. 
You need to know that as a man of God. So you don't assume. Then the ordinary believer who just came to church will laugh at people praying. He doesn't care. Don't be angry. That's why he's there. And then you transit that person methodically, patiently. He becomes an enlightened believer. Then you introduce, if all you know is doctrine and you do not have power, this is where you will stop people. You can't go further because the power of the Holy Spirit will have to continue the journey. Doctrine is profitable, but without power, people will stop here. So you will gather a lot of intellectuals making arguments, propositions without the capacity to make manifest the things they know. God is good. I know the scripture. You are right. It's here, but not here. God heals. I can tell you, Mark chapter this, verse this. I've been properly taught. I know what prayer does. Prayer, we can intercede. There are all kinds of spirits. There are principalities. There are powers. You've been well mentored. But unfortunately, you will become so frustrated because you are full of light and the grace that will release it to you and your world has not come. So many of us are here right now, full of light. Something in you wants to break out. But the capacity, and if you attempt to do what this man is doing here, you will be disappointed. The disciples were in training. One time they couldn't wait again. And they went to a, an epileptic patient. Remember, left disappointed and pained and said, no, come on. They knew about healing, but it was not just knowledge. They needed something else. But when that grace came upon them, the shadow of Peter, handkerchiefs and aprons were taken from Peter. Then you get here, empowered believer, a witness. I will leave you until we get tomorrow. I will show you that beyond here, there is also one more step. Because there is something you must know to remain empowered. Mm. Empowerment is very sensitive. You can lose many things. Because with the coming of the anointing upon your life will come many other things. Mm. Pride, complacency. There is a skill to remaining at this realm. Your relevance does not just depend on your arriving here, but your remaining there. There are many people who began to die when they got here. Because at this point, you are called a celebrity. Joshua Selman. Now the world knows you. Whether you pray or not. At this point, you have some credibility. There is a kind of temptation that only comes when you are here. You will never know that there is such a reality. Listen, if you know this, you will know why God mandates to pray for all leaders. There are certain attacks that never happen here. Never happen here. Satan will be patient even, even if it's after 20 years. Please do not miss tomorrow. Because among the things I'll be teaching you is the dynamics of warfare. I will show you how great men remain here. And how territories are taken. <laughs> Hallelujah. Watch this. This man cannot save Boston. No. No. He will only keep having dreams of a revival coming. This one will be the one who will be pointing at people and say, look, don't worry, a move is coming. He's right. <laughs> but it will never happen. I know a move is coming. He's not wrong. But this man is the one that God can come through and say, I want to deliver Boston to your hand. Can I trust you for the next three years with my program? Please rise up. Don't be distracted. We're about to pray. There are three levels of authority in the Bible that can be given to believers. Gentlemen, I'm grateful, thank you. There are three levels of authority. Please listen. This will be my final thought with us. 
Number one, the, when you begin to walk with God, the least level of authority you receive is authority over things. Hmm. The things that we clamor for are wonderful, but when you have authority over things like money, like property, it's wonderful, but you don't really weigh much in the spirit. It is the least level of spiritual authority. Authority over things. Hallelujah. The next level of authority you can walk in is authority over territories. When God increases your ranking in the spirit, you are given access. Your sphere of influence is enlarged so that your apostolic reach extends to territories. You speak from one place, but the reaction happens in several places. Is growth in the spirit. The highest level of authority as recorded from scripture that an individual can have is the authority that God gives you to steward his program. Do you know what that means? So God says, because you have been faithful, I have a goal in my heart that in the next five years, I want to turn Boston, I want to turn Cambridge to become like Azusa Street. So you are the one. Listen, God will use everybody, but he does not start with everybody. He will come to one person and say, can I trust you? You have demonstrated faithfulness. I want to place grace. You will not be the one to do the work alone, but that program is given to you. The first thing God gave the people in the parable of the talent were talents. The talents were things, but they were a test. The goal was not the talent. Their faithfulness, one of the synoptic accounts will say, you have been faithful with little. I will make you ruler. And they were given territories. But the highest level of authority a believer can demonstrate in this side of God's kingdom is to be trusted with a portion of God's kingdom come project. This is what was done with Paul. Paul did not just have authority over things and over territories, but he was literally given the apostolic ministry to the Gentiles. Peter was given to the Jews. None of the disciples and apostles had the encounter that was documented in the book of Revelation. Only one person, John the Beloved. And John was told in heaven, write. Paul was told to write. Peter was told to write. Those who get to that realm of authority over God's program are the ones who write. They write for generations to come. They have earned a status in the spirit where God would tell them you cannot die with what you have. Right? They are given the grace to mentor people. You are in this place right now and thank you for, this, uh, for being patient. I know I've stretched you a bit. We're wrapping up. But this is a build up to a very weighty discussion we're going to have tomorrow. I'll be praying over the sick, prophesying and imparting grace upon you. But impartation is useless until this build up is there. For many of you, by what you have received now, you are almost saying, have I been a Christian at all? Don't be discouraged. It is important to provoke one another unto godliness. Not to create an offense, but to challenge you. Some of you will go back home and sit down and say, my God, what have I been doing? That is a very good state because now the Holy Spirit can come. Revival don't, don't just come because you see it coming. If you have not met Jesus Christ, you are even outside. If you have met him and you have refused to be transformed, I don't care about church, I don't care about any pastor, I don't care about anyone, that understanding is an attack. That state of thinking itself is an attack. Attempted to rob you from your spiritual transition to a place where you become a transformed believer. And then if you are transformed, 
having, the Bible says, ever learning but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Knowledge can puff up. And there are many people who come here and talk about what God can do that never gets done through them. Then you come to this realm. Some of you, by grace and by mercy, you are here right now, this third phase. But there is a unique attack and the dynamics of living at this realm. Some of you did not even last there. Every kind of thing from carnality to pride to flesh to lust to self-righteousness to feeling you are better than everybody. And that has already destroyed the potential of your manifestation. Because at this point, you will have money, you will have influence, everybody will like you, the devil will send all kinds of people to your life. If you do not understand the intelligence, this is where great revivalists died. Because they were not mentored. Some of them had lonely parts. They didn't know how to preserve the oil. This was the tragedy of Samson. Please pray in one minute. Lord, I am available. Use me. Use me. Whether you came here to study and you're returning back to your nation or you are here permanently in America, those who are falling online, please join us as we pray. We've been discussing matters of the move of God. Please take a minute to pray. Pray, I'm available. I desire that transition in the spirit from an ordinary believer, void of knowledge, void of passion, to a transformed believer, full of light, through the ministry of the word, through the ministry of prayer, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, through the ministry of a teaching priest. And then for some of you, you have encompassed this mountain of transformation long enough. It's time to move to a realm of empowerment where you become demonstrators of his life and power, his healing, his wisdom, where you can be used, given mandates over territories. One minute in prayer and then we're done. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. If you look at my shirt, you will see a very bold statement written there. Jesus revealed. Jesus glorified. This is one of the biggest secrets of remaining here. When it becomes about you and you fall prey to the deception of celebrity living, you are gone. Great men remain because they live to make him great. Great men remain because like John, they are not ashamed to decrease. Even if it stings their ego, they rather be forgotten and he be remembered through their life. I can tell you this, ladies and gentlemen. Tomorrow I hope I'll tell you a bit about my story. Please come early. If there is one secret about the life of this man you see standing before you, behind every great thing you have heard, Revive us across the nations to the glory of God. This is it. This is the central governing creed. The theme of my life. This is why I live. Jesus revealed through my life. Jesus glorified through my life. And if I be lifted up, I will draw men. If you can hide behind the cross and get out of the way, there is a man of power that can rise from you. There is a world changer that can rise from you. There is a revivalist that can rise from you. Let this be your final prayer tonight. Lord, let me decrease that Jesus will increase. 
please go ahead and pray every flesh every search for vain glory I'm not saying you will not be lifted I'm not saying you will not be glorified but to truly become a manifestation of the glory of God you must die to self die to self the price for all of God is all of you the price for all of God is all of you the price for all of God is all of you hallelujah amen now please let me make one final altar call and I'm out of your face for tonight I never end a meeting like this making assumptions as far as salvation is concerned you are in this place tonight or across any expressions if there are any overflows but particularly for those who are connected from across the globe here in America Europe Africa you heard me teach and whilst I was teaching the Spirit of God who convicts men was speaking to your heart that you have to win that war once and for all you see the things about God or the, about the kingdom is that you are never compelled forced against your will to do anything this is the difference between the Holy Spirit and a demon spirit behold I stand I created you but I'm not ashamed to stand and knock if you reject me I will respect you even to the detriment of your eternal destiny you are in this place no assumptions you are saying apostle if you will give me an opportunity I truly genuinely unashamedly want to make Jesus Lord of my life that includes those who are connecting from across the globe following by television following by the internet and for those people I want to steal out a minute and lead you to make this prayer if you belong to any of those categories or you are saying apostle I truly want to rededicate my life genuinely may I please request boldly unashamedly please leave your seat and come and stand here I'll just count three don't leave anyone don't be ashamed don't say there's someone watching me no this is this is a business of destiny is there any such persons please make your way here our country and we begin to pray thank you one let's bless them go ahead bless them come come thank you come thank you come it's a new season for you come come God bless you for the sake of your children. Come. For the sake of the destinies connected to you. Our Father is coming. Let's bless God for him. Come. 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 You're never too old to meet with Jesus. You're never too young to meet with Jesus. Come. hallelujah ladies and gentlemen I want to thank you for the boldness to walk up here declaring the Lordship of Jesus over your life I want you to see yourself as one who has been called to receive an award except that this surpasses any and every kind of award you will get <laughs> awards are for people deserving but the life of God is for people undeserving beginning from us to everyone here and so thank you very much for this may I lead you to make this declaration of faith and I want you to know that even though you are here in the midst of God's people I want you to just see Jesus standing in front of you loving you with his arms opened telling you it doesn't matter what you've done or not done he's able to give you a new beginning lift your right hand let me request please 
And I want you to say this as loud and as clear as you can. Say, Lord Jesus. Tonight, I have heard your word. I love you with all my heart. I believe that you died for me. I believe that you rose again for my justification. Right now, I receive Jesus into my heart. Be my Savior, my Lord, and my King. I declare that the power of sin, Satan, hell, and the grave is broken over my life. I'm a child of God. I live victorious from tonight and forever. Amen. Keep your wonderful hands lifted. Father, thank you. The Bible declares that as many who will come to you, you will in no wise cast away. These lovely, beautiful, and precious people have come declaring your lordship over their lives. Let the grace that saves rest upon you. And I pray, I commend you to the ministry of the word and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that you begin to walk in victory even beginning from today. Madam, look at me. The power of God is coming on you. I decree and declare, I just saw something tying you in the name of Jesus. I release you from it now. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are released forever by the power of the Holy Spirit.